and it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ruth Wormsley, who's an original member of Cranberry Commons co-housing community in North Burnaby. And uh, she was very much involved in the process of developing and, and building that community uh, before everyone moved in in 2001. So she's going to talk to us about those processes and the fact that if I'm reading it correctly, you've got three generations, Ruth, right? In in the uh, in the in Cranberry Commons, so yes, yeah, quite yeah. something. So over to you, Ruth. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's really nice to be here with you, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, and I'm actually really happy not to have to go outside today and really mm -hmm. happy to be able to join you on Zoom because it's a very cold and wet out there. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to share my screen and uh, um, I have uh, a PowerPoint that I'll, I'll kind of have showing while I'm, <clears throat> while I'm talking. So yeah, um, let's see here. This worked before, didn't it? Oh, there. Okay. Okay. So, um, Cranberry Commons, so I'll be speaking for about 20 minutes and then uh, there'll be some time for questions and answers. So please feel free to just uh, make a note of any questions that occur to you um, during, during the talk. Um, yeah, this photo was taken about two years ago, I think, in our courtyard. So some of the people are, uh, not here anymore and, and there's some new people. Um, Cranberry Commons is composed of uh, 22 households, so we're quite a small, um, small community. Uh, we have about 42 residents at the moment. Um, we are intergenerational by design, but we currently only have three full-time uh, young children. We started out 21 years ago with about nine kids, but uh, at this point they have all grown up. And as you know, uh, real estate is very uh, difficult for young families to afford, as well as not just young families, but it's just difficult to afford, period. And so we don't have as many young kids anymore. Actually, you can see my son right there in the back, right behind me, the tall one in the, ra in the red hat. And uh, he is actually... Um, uh, renting an apartment, an apartment here right now uh, with his girlfriend. So, and my mom also uh, lives here. So, as uh, Sneja was saying, we have three three generations. Uh, when I say intergenerational by design, um, what I mean is that we actually have a variety of types of homes, ranging from apartments. Uh, that are all on one level with no stairs um, and elevator access, uh, which are more attractive to an older demographic. So what you're seeing right here is the front of our building uh, facing Albert Street, and it's four stories, and those are all apartments, uh, one level with no stairs. Um, and we have, uh, you know, different types. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah, and then we also have uh, three level townhouses, which is what uh, my husband and I uh, live in currently and our two children uh, were raised in. Um, so three bedroom, three level townhouses with, um, with outdoor access, uh, like little backyards, which are obviously you know, attractive to, uh, to people with, uh, with kids families. We also have uh, on one side of our community, we have split level townhouses, which are two two levels up and two levels down. We have uh, five of those. We have, and as was mentioned, yeah, several multi-generational families. I think ours is the only one that we have uh, currently. Uh, my mom uh, lives uh, in her own apartment here at Cranberry. Uh, she's 92 now. So it was wonderful having her here the whole time my kids were growing up. And now it's fantastic to be able to be so close to her um, and to be able to, uh, you know, support each other. Pardon? 
it is i'm just watching yeah um so yeah legally uh cranberry commons is a, a strata corporation uh no different from any other strata the difference is that in co-housing uh the project is developed and driven by the residents as opposed to by an external developer uh, developing a co-housing community uh, a project is uh is a lot of volunteer effort but it's definitely uh definitely has benefits um one of the benefits is uh you could say that the uh the profit that would normally get funneled off to a developer actually stays in the community and one way of looking at it is is that it stays in the community in the form of amenities because when we buy into Cranberry Commons, we, we are only paying for our unit, but we have access to all these incredible shared amenities, which were built into the community. Um, we have uh, a courtyard, uh, which is one of the views that you're seeing right now. This is the view that includes the children's play area. Uh, the courtyard gets used a lot for socializing and for children's play space. Uh, there's a shared natural gas barbecue that gets a, a lot of use, especially in the summer. This is the same little, uh, <laughs> it's actually the same as this, slightly different angle, but this is just this past New Year's Eve. You can see the snow on the ground and we had a, uh, a, a like a campfire in the, in the little play circle there with, you know, marshmallows and guitar and singing and yeah, so uh, it gets used a lot for, for different different things. We also have uh, what we call a common house, which is like a large dining room with a, a kitchen and a lounge uh, with a fireplace and a children's play room. Um, so we gather here for all sorts of things, uh, meals and uh, events. Uh, this is the lounge. There's a bunch of kids uh, in there playing a game. Uh, this is a view of the kitchen, somebody preparing uh, probably, I don't know what he's preparing, but yeah, it's really nice having a, a big kitchen that is, uh, uh, we have like two, two uh, stoves, two ovens, one huge freezer, uh, stand-up freezer and a fridge and um, just another shot of the kitchen. Um, this is also the same dining room at Christmas time, um, tradition of uh, doing gingerbread houses with the kids. Uh, the obviously the common house gets used a lot for for meetings and all all sorts of uh, different events. Um, other shared amenities uh, besides this common house are uh, a shared guest suite, uh, which is it's free for us to use. All of these things are considered an extension of our homes. Because one thing about co-housing is that the homes tend to be fairly small. Uh, for instance, we don't have guest rooms generally, unless you're an empty nester like me and the kids have left and you have like bedrooms that are not inhabited by the kids anymore. Um, but we, um, so most people don't have a guest room, so we have a shared guest room. Uh, we have a laundry room. Again, you have the option of having laundry in your unit or use, you can use that for storage and then use the shared uh, laundry. Uh, there's a multi-use room. There's a workshop with a great, you know, woodworking uh, tools and so on. Um, and then the outdoor shared spaces are, there's a roof, a roof deck patio. Uh, there's a clothes drying area. There's a vegetable garden. That's a shot of uh, the veg. I mean, it's not, it, it's fairly dense, you know, 22 units on five city lots. So we don't have a huge amount of gardening space, but we make good use of the space that we have. Um, one of the beauties of co-housing and community living in general is the sharing of resources. So uh, we have, for instance, a garden shed where we have all of our shared tools and we have like one lawnmower for 22 units whereas everybody used to have you know one per home so uh, there's a lot of skill sharing and resource sharing that goes on 
Uh, people help each other out a lot. You know, if somebody's sick or just had a baby or something like that, you know, there'll be like a meal train organized where uh, people will bring food. Um, if somebody's really good at fixing cars, they'll help out that way or computers. So there's a lot of skill sharing um, and resource sharing that uh, that goes on. Um, we have an underground parking area with a storage room. Storage is a bit of a challenge, but we, you know, we do, we make do with not having as much as we would really like. Um, the parkade has a bicycle storage enclosure and recycling. We currently have two EV chargers, but we're exploring options right now for becoming completely EV ready by um, installing wiring um, to every parking stall. So just to give a brief description of our uh, what our development process was like. Um, so once we had a core group of people together who were committed to uh, being part of this uh, project, and in the beginning, a commitment involved making, I believe at the time, it was a, like 25 years ago, it was a $10,000 commitment. Um, and that guaranteed you a, a, a spot, a unit. Um, so once we were, you know, had a core group, and that doesn't mean that all, you know, we didn't have enough to, you know, 22 units, but we had enough of a core group that we were ready to move forward. At that point, we, um, you know, we collectively hired various professionals to support us in developing the project. Um, that included a co-housing consultant, <clears throat> an architect and a construction manager. Uh, we found our current site in North Burnaby in about 1997. It uh, consisted of five city lots. Well, it still consists of five city lots, which were uh, are 20, 33 feet wide by 120 feet deep. So that's the, the footprint um, of, our, of our building. Um, Three families, including um, my family, banded together uh, enough money to buy one of the lots, which was privately owned. And that gave us the first option to buy the other four, which were owned by the city of Burnaby. Um, we had to get a construction loan to, uh, to be able to do that. Um, <clears throat> so we worked with an architect to kind of shape the general design of the project uh, in very rough terms. That was uh, the idea of having a central courtyard with four, with buildings all around each of the four sides. Um, and there are gates which make it so that people can't just like walk in off the street, which is really a, a nice thing for the kids, just to sort of feel a little bit more like the kids can play freely without having to worry about people just wandering in off the street. Um, yeah, so um, over the years of getting the project developed and built, um, as you can imagine, there were many, many, many meetings. It sometimes felt like it was a part-time job or for some people, maybe a full-time job at times to do this. I definitely would not recommend even trying anything like this without hiring consultants and professionals to help you because we're all lay people and don't really know all of the ropes. So that was invaluable to have um, consultants and professionals. Um, some of our meetings were uh, to make decisions uh, about construction and the building. Some were to build community. We did quite a few community building things. We even went camping together one summer uh, and really did things to understand and get to know each other better. Um, and we also had many public information meetings where we would advertise uh, in the local papers um, or whatever, and then invite people to come and hear about the project and um, attract new members. So our goal was to have all of the units sold by the time of move-in. <clears throat> and we barely, we just barely succeeded in doing that. So we had all 22 units sold by the time we moved in because we were on the hook to pay back the construction loan um, by the time the community was finished. So we didn't want to have to dig into our own pockets to do that. <clears throat> <clears throat> so in 
So in terms of just a little bit about management and governance of the community, uh, we're com currently completely self-managed. Um, when we first started, we had a, a management uh, company that was handling our uh, finances or our like paying the bills and that kind of thing. But it was expensive and we didn't feel like they were actually even doing that great of a job. And so at, uh, quite a few years ago, we ditched that and just started doing it ourselves. So um, we have uh, various, you know, committees and teams that um, that handle uh, the necessary things, such as we have a legal finance team, a maintenance team, a steering committee, <clears throat> a landscaping committee, a community building committee, and what we call a heart circle, which is um, there to help uh, when, you know, in the case of uh, a need for conflict resolution. We have um, monthly work bees, which happen like once a month on a Saturday morning, where we take care of, you know, routine cleanups and maintenance. We have an AGM once a year where we elect the, the necessary positions of uh, president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. But the decision making is done by the entire community at monthly community meetings. There is no executive group which makes uh, decisions on behalf of the community. I think that is more typical of a, <clears throat> of a typical strata. And I think it can also make for uh, tension. Um, uh, in, in our case, uh, every owner is a member of the strata council. Um, so we have, as I mentioned, a steering committee, which produces the agendas and sort of keeps track of the big picture. And our facilitation team rotates the facilitation of the meetings. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about decision making. Um, well, typical stratas generally use Robert's rules, co-housing communities generally use some variation on consensus-based decision-making, which is uh, non-hierarchical and doesn't involve voting. We have monthly community meetings uh, at which we make decisions. Um, the items which uh, we have agreed can come to a community meeting, uh, are very specific, and actually, this was a point of uh, of a of a lot of conflict in the community as we evolved over time. Some people wanted a more relaxed approach to our business meetings, and other people wanted them to be like very business oriented and uh, not to include anything that wasn't business. So we had to organize a series of uh, facilitated conversations with an outside facilitator to help us come to agreement about what we would uh, handle at our community meetings. So what you're seeing on this slide is actually what we have agreed um, can come to our, uh, our community meetings. Um, <clears throat> The only thing in there that's flexible is the fourth point. Any decision or new idea that is not within the approved, I can't see what the word is underneath that, uh, mandate probably of committees. So we had to leave a little opening there. Um, So of course there's uh, there's lots of delegating. The various teams and committees have approved mandates and operating budgets, which uh, they are authorized to spend, and decisions which they're authorized to make. So we don't need to bring every little thing to a business meeting. Um, what comes to our community? We use a, we use proposals for decision making. Um, usually they're written proposals. Uh, any proposal which uh, is high impact, all the things on the left um, need to have a written one. And of course, things that are uh, either urgent or, uh, or low impact uh, do, not, do not need to have a written proposal. 
we usually our, our general uh, process is that we we do not generally make decisions at one meeting. We make we require two dis two meetings to make a decision. Um, that allows uh, people who weren't at the first meeting time to uh, to get up to speed. If it also uh, gives people time to think about it before before we make a decision. It seems to work well. I mean, obviously the uh, the exception would be again if it was like an emergency or or else uh, something that was so routine that it didn't need a second meeting. Uh, most co-housing communities use a system of colored cards in our decision making and um, and discussion when we're having our our community meetings. Um, they're used differently in decision making as opposed to discussion. So in discussion, putting up a green card indicates a desire to speak. So everyone in the meeting would have a, a set of these cards. Um, if you want to speak, you put up a green card. Uh, and then you would be called upon in the order that you put up your card. So that's a really good way to keep uh, people from talking over each other, generally works well. Um, if you put up a yellow card, that actually trumps the green card because it means you have important clarification that would add to the, the discussion. If you put up a red card, it means stop the process, Something is um, something's off track. We're not following our agreed upon process or something like that. Um, yeah, so then in decision making, um, when the facilitator asks for a show of cards on a decision, holding up a green card means that you agree. Holding up a yellow card means you have reservations, but you're not willing to uh, block the decision. Um, and then usually your, your concern would be recorded in the minutes. Um, holding up a red card indicates that you're um, in opposition with the decision um, based on the belief that it's not in the best interests of the group. Um, so red cards are, according to our agreements, are not to be used for personal reasons, such as if a person does not like how the decision will affect them personally. Uh, showing a red card also involves a responsibility to work with others to come up with a solution prior to the next time it comes to the group uh, to be reconsidered. And if uh, the person showing the red card doesn't follow through on that, then their red card becomes invalid. So if somebody, uh, yes, I already said that, didn't I? Yes. Um, I, one, yeah, so it's not really possible for one person to block a decision that the rest of the community wants to uh, move forward with. Um, it takes three red cards from three different households to actually block a decision. But actually, I, I don't, in all the 21 years I've lived here, I can't remember that ever happening. But it's important, I think, to have some kind of fallback if you if you do end up in a situation where um, you're really stuck. So um, that's that's the way that we we kind of uh, have have come to. We've evolved uh, over the time that we've been together. So yeah, unlike Robert's rules, um, our consensus building process. Uh, it, uh, you know, Robert's rules tends to only allow for a yes, no vote, whereas consensus allows for a, a continuum. Um, and the objective is not necessarily to get full agreement, but the goal is to get full, full consent. And that doesn't necessarily mean everyone is fully satisfied with the decision, but um, hopefully it's acceptable enough that everyone can commit to supporting the group in moving forward. So that is basically what I had planned to say. Um, I guess that was, was that about 20 minutes? Anyway. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Terrific. So the usual, uh, if people want to ask a question, hands, do the hands function? Yeah.
Arlene. Arlene, yes. Uh, you're muted. Arlene, you're muted. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I just have a quick question. Um, I was just curious about the square footage of each unit and to, do and do they vary? And do they what? Vary. Is oh, very, vary. Oh, definitely. Like in I the, said, in the size. Yes, they definitely do. Um, as I as I said, there's like quite a few different designs uh, based. Like so, our three floor, uh, th uh, three level, uh, three bedroom townhouse is about twelve hundred and fifty square feet, and um, there's one bedroom apartments which are probably around seven six fifty seven hundred. There's two bedroom apartments. There's three bedroom apartments. Uh, so yeah, it varies an awful lot actually. Um, but the the smaller number of uh, designs that you can, we were encouraged at the beginning to try to keep the number of designs to a minimum because it's cheaper. It's cheaper to build, you know, when you have a, a smaller number of, of designs, but you also want to have something that's going to appeal because we were aiming for an intergenerational community. We wanted to have a variety of, of designs that would work for families as well as for as like a single elder. Like my mom lives in a two bedroom, one level apartment, which is I think about 900 square feet. It's mm, big. Yeah. More questions? Yes, Joyce. You're muted. You unmute, unmute. Okay, I'm okay right now? Yeah. Okay. I just wondered how long it took between when you started this whole project and when you were able to move in. Oh, that's an interesting question. It sort of depends on where you start the clock. Like there was a group that was involved in trying to develop a co-housing community for 10 years before before we actually moved in. Don't don't worry. I mean, I don't oh. want to get you really too into a panic <laughs> here. Um, but uh, the reason for that was because they were trying to develop something in the west side of Vancouver. And they had certain criteria, like it had to be affordable. It had to be fairly level, like within walking distance of stuff. Um, uh, I don't remember what all the other criteria was, but they weren't able to find anything that fit what they needed. And so they ended up finding this lot here, this this parcel of land here. And um, my husband and I got involved four years before we actually were had the you know building completed. So it took it took four years from the time we started um, being involved. So that's four years from when you found a site. Pretty much, pretty much. Is that yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's possible to do it quicker. That was that was just that was how long it took us. It'd be interesting to know what what it, the story is for more recently for other co housing communities. Hmm. Good, thank you, Kathy. Hey. Um, Thank you, Ruth. That was really uh, very clear. And oh, I know Ruth and I, I know the um, uh, co co Cranberry Commons very well. And it's yeah. very well run and uh, uh, interesting group of people and interesting setup. What I wanted to ask is if someone buys, uh, sells and then someone else buys, do they need approval of the group uh, to be able to move in? No, that's that's an interesting question too. Um, I should just mention that, like before I joined, the group was set up as a cooperative, and in that case, they would have, I believe, needed the approval of the group. Um, uh, I personally, my husband and I, didn't really feel comfortable with joining the cooperative, partly because you don't own your own unit outright. You own kind of shares in the project. And we just personally didn't really feel comfortable investing in the project without having some, you know, autonomy to sell when we wanted to sell or to sell who we wanted to sell to, that type of thing. So we waited. I think the, the group 
that had been involved before us realized that they weren't attracting new members. And so they decided to switch to being a strata. And that was the point at which we joined. Um, and it took a while to just, oh, and we also formed a development corporation. We needed to do that in order to, um, to develop this project. We were a corporation. Mm -hmm. And then eventually uh, within a year or two after we moved in, we dissolved that development corporation. Um, now I'm trying to remember, oh yes. Yeah. So the way it works with selling, um, we are legally a strata. So the seller has the legal right to sell to whoever they want without any, uh, the community legally has no say in, in who, uh, who a seller um, would sell their unit to. But in reality, fortunately, uh, that isn't the way that it works here at Cranberry Commons. Um, we actually have always been really involved as a group in the selling uh, of units. So we have some people in the community who have been uh, realtors in the past and who have a lot of knowledge who have, who have been able to assist with that. And so what we usually do is we have a long um, list of people who have signed up to be informed when a unit comes for sale. And by the way, if anybody's interested, just go to our website and you can add your name um, to that list. And what that means is you'll just be informed when a unit comes up for sale or rent. And uh, so usually what happens is the seller would sign an agreement with the community. And the agreement is that the community will help to market the unit. They'll help with the, um, with the transaction of uh, um, uh, representing, uh, well, they'll help with, in, I can't remember exactly what all the, the details are on that, but um, in exchange for helping to find a buyer, um, the seller would then make a contribution, a financial contribution to the community. And I think it's somewhere around $13,000. Um, something like that. Um, and that goes into what we call a community improvement fund, which is used for various improvements around the community. Uh, so that has actually been a really functional system because it means that people that are coming in who are interested in buying, they get to meet everybody, they get to hear about what we are, they, um, they get to know what it is that they're buying into. Uh, so Fortunately, generally the people that have moved in here are people that have been a great fit and really want to live in co-housing. So we've been quite lucky that way. I mean, some people are more involved than others, but uh, generally almost everybody who lives here is, is involved in the community to some extent and some very involved. <laughs> So maybe this is the point where I can ask the question that we were talking about before the meeting actually started. And, and it's a, a point that you made, uh, Ruth, just to delve into it a little more. Uh, the idea that um, next meeting, we're going to be looking at the co-op housing model. Right, um, right. But your point was that in terms of building community, there seems more of a engagement um, or dedication to that with co-housing than with co-op housing. Do you want to say a bit more about that in your experience? Yeah, I've never lived in a co-op, but when we're talking about, I think we're talking about two different things when we're talking about co-ops. There's there's housing co-ops where people, you know, there's lots of them in the lower mainland where uh, I think people pay a certain amount uh, up front. I think it used to be a thousand dollars. I don't know what it is now. And that that gets returned to them when they when they leave and then they pay basically rent. So there's no like, you know, they're not purchasing. Uh, so it's, it's affordable, it's more affordable. Whereas co-housing is like, it's a totally different, like it's a strata where people are paying market um, <clears throat> rates to buy into it. However, um, even a co-housing community could be structured legally as a cooperative, uh, mm -hmm. or it could be structured as a strata. And maybe there's other structures that I'm, I'm there's probably like land trusts and other, other things that I'm not very informed about. 
But this particular group that is now Cranberry Commons used to be structured as a cooperative and people still would have had to pay similar amounts of money to buy their home you know, or to, to build the community. Um, but they would not have had, we would not, I would not have had the kind of, um, you know, I think that part of the motivation for it to be set up as a cooperative was um, because people wanted to have more control over, over who was going to move in and that sort of thing. And I think that was part of what some of us felt uncomfortable with. Like we have actually done really well on the self-selection uh, basis. So the people that move in here are self-selected. You know, they come, they they find out about us, and they decide if they like it, if it suits them. We don't we don't, don't approve them. You know, it's really up in the end. It's up to the seller, like what offer they're going to accept. And sometimes the seller might choose a family over, like they might choose something that they think is a better fit for the community. Um, but I think what I was saying before, which what you were alluding to about the sense of community is like in a housing co-op, I think, it, you know, a typical housing co-op, uh, I think people move in there for a variety of reasons. A lot of people are interested in community. And I, I think there's a lot of community in housing co-ops. But I think some people tend to be there because it's affordable and they're not as interested in the community aspect of it. So I, I do think there's that there's that dynamic. Okay. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Jillian. Yeah, this is really interesting, and uh, I just wonder if you'd say a little bit more about conflict resolution. Um, <laughs> and we we all know uh, in our work environments as well, and other contexts, that some people take on a lot of work, and some people are not so keen. Uh, to do their share. So I can imagine that in uh, a co-housing situation, uh, there can be tensions around that kind of thing. So I'm not thinking of, you know, major conflicts necessarily, but kind of the, the uh, I don't know, day-to-day -day tensions. How, how do you, how do those get mediated and resolved? And um, what's your experience with that? Right. Oh yeah, just just thinking about what you said about uh, people putting more energy than others. Um, so one of the things we decided, like some communities, like I think uh, Windsong and Langley, and and some other co-housing communities, require there's like a mandatory amount of volunteer hours that you that you have to put in, and we decided not to do that. Um, and I think if you have, I think you have to have a certain size community for that to not be, for that to work. Um, like our community is kind of on the small side, like it's 22 units, Winsong is 30. Um, and, you know, as I say it, it has, you know, there are some people that put in obviously more time and energy than others. Um, but as far as conflict, um, I mean, I guess, the number one thing, like we do actually have a conflict resolution guidelines uh, that we have um, drafted, um, which I'm, I'm happy to share at some point if, if you wanna see them. Uh, I think the first thing is to see if you can talk to the person that you're having tension with first. Um, and that's why we have the heart circle uh, that I mentioned earlier, so that if uh, if it feels like uh, that's not working. Um, there's a couple people in the community that you can go and talk to and uh, um, that who are willing to maybe sit down and help um, support a conversation. We have also often, I won't say often, but it, we have over the years regularly engaged outside facilitators uh, to come and uh, help to um, facilitate uh, coming to resolution of, of various uh, problems. Uh, one of the really cool <clears throat> things that, that has happened is that there's um, there's been this integrated facilitation training program, which uh, has involved most of the co-housing communities in British Columbia. And it's happened over a course of uh, two years. And it, it there'll be a, a weekend every, say, 
it's not happening now. It's kind of wrapped up. But uh, during the time it was happening, there'd be a workshop, a weekend workshop every, I think it was every four months, and it would get rotated around to all the different co-housing communities. And there were outside facilitators that came and and there was always a different subject for each weekend. And each community that hosted it would come up with a con with a, an issue that they needed help resolving. And then all of the student facilitators would take turns um, helping to or, or basically facilitating with the support of the trainers and the, the group um, uh, facilitating helping to resolve whatever it was that uh, was the problem. Um, so coming out of that now, we are able to, like we know that there's, you know, Kathy over at Keyside or, or whoever over at other co-housing communities who we can um, ask for help. So the co-housing communities actually help each other. Uh, if we need somebody, because often when you're in a community, everybody's too close to, uh, the conflict, you know, to be able to effectively um, mediate it or, or to, to facilitate it. So it's great to have um, a wider pool of, of people that uh, can be drawn on. But it's not easy, you know, of course, there's always, uh, I mean, I've been here 21 years and I've seen an awful lot of ebbs and flows and uh, COVID was was a real was really hard. Um, we had a lot of people move out and a, quite a few people move in. Well, the same number of households. Um, we had a number of turn. There was quite a bit of turnover of households during COVID, and that was really hard because, like. It almost feels like we need to get to know each other, get to know who we are as a community again. And you know, things have loosened up quite a bit. We're back to having our month, our weekly potlucks. So every Monday we have uh, like a potluck. Uh, this is what we've been doing this like since the beginning, um, but we weren't doing it during COVID. And all of our meetings were on Zoom, and it was just it was really hard. But feels like we're kind of coming through that more now. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, other yeah. question? Oh, Anne. What do you do about insurance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's super expensive. Like it's uh, like, we're lucky we can get it. I've heard of Stratus that can't even get insurance. Um, I don't know. I think I want to say it's up like around getting up toward 30 grand or something a year for insurance. It's crazy expensive. Uh, yeah, we, um, I think our building was under valued for a while. Like our insurance was like really cheap. And then we realized that we needed to get a more accurate, uh, you know, evaluation of the, the building so that we could get the appropriate amount of coverage that we needed. So um, we were now, we have depreciation. I don't know if you've heard of depreciation reports. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we are working with uh, professionals that provide that kind of information. Um, so yeah, we just pay what we have to pay and that's, that's all we can do. And it's all prorated according to the size of the unit that you've got? Yes, yeah. And our strata fees are quite high here. Um, but that does include a fairly generous uh, contribution toward our uh, contingency reserve fund. And also it includes our heat. Our, we're heated with um, natural gas. So like mm -hmm. for our, our townhouse, it's getting up toward a thousand dollars a month for our strata fees so right. Alice uh, you're muted Allison unmute. my question is um, about the the actual process of coming to your processes if you will um, I'm interested that you that there are you had a consultant to help you with all that to what extent are the processes you have, um suggested by the facilitator and developed by the group itself well it's definitely evolved over 
the years. Uh, some of it has been fine-tuned by experience. I think our consultant uh, at the beginning probably was quite influential in helping us to um, to get some of those processes in place. Uh, we also have uh, like a work, we had a workshop, a weekend workshop with an outside facilitator uh, who is just an expert in community process and, and consensus and all of that. It, that was when we started having a steering committee, for instance. Um, we had a lot of conflict around agendas and community meetings. And uh, so we realized that it wasn't something, it wasn't appropriate for like one person to be in that position. So we then now have a steering committee who, so it's something that's developed mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's probably still, still developing. Christina. Oh, hi, Ruth. Hi. Um, thanks for your presentation. It's been really wonderful to hear, to, to get such a great overview and from your personal perspective. I'm curious, um, talking pre-COVID now, how you as a group ended up with a single potluck meal per week. A lot of communities do um, shared cooking and are much more active and do several meals per week together that they actually cook together and have rotations of cooking committees and so forth. So I'm curious to know how you landed on that as a community. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it seems like it's always been this way with our community. Um, we do have community meals, but they're not on a, a regular weekly basis. Um, sometimes it's just spontaneous when, when somebody uh, gets inspired to do it. Uh, and we always have uh, what we call planned potlucks on um, special occasions, you know, Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. In fact, I've been thinking about that more lately. Like, um, I think some people feel intimidated by cooking for a large group. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about having... Last time we were having more regular community meals, they were small community meals. So they were kind of limited to 12 or 15 people. Um, so yeah, it just seems that right now, and, and maybe maybe that's been true all along, there just hasn't really been maybe the energy or the interest in having it like uh, two or three times a week. Like I know Vancouver co-housing has them like two or three times a week, but they're also yeah. a new community. So they're still sort of in their honeymoon kind of stage where they have like tons of energy for organizing all that kind of stuff. Well, and, not that new, but they do have a dietitian chef in their community. So that might be part of it. Well, I maybe, maybe it's not Vancouver. What's the new one over by? Um, oh, Mountain, Mountain View. Mountain View. Mountain View yeah. is new. And they have a lot of community meals. There. Yeah, Vancouver does too. So I, um, it was a bit of a leading question because I was wondering whether you would come around to something that I'd heard, which was that the amount of activities that the community engages in collectively are almost directly related to when the common facilities were instituted. So for example, Harborside, which started with uh, Marina Guesthouse Place, they had their common facilities in place before any digging was done. So they had the, you know, and whereas other communities have said, we have to move in right away, let's leave the common house until later. And in doing that, the activities that would, that the common house would support also sort of got sidelined and never really developed fully. So I was wondering if that had any impact on your community. I don't think so, because it was all basically done at the same time. Yeah, so, so. it's just a people thing, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I would like to have more. I'd like to have at least one community meal a week in addition to the potluck. The potluck is great because it's not a lot of work and nobody has to organize it. Yeah. But I, I would definitely. So the idea being that I could cook once a month if there was a small pool of people that were willing to cook once a month and then just come to a meal, uh, you know, the other three weeks of the month, then um, I think that would be great. I'd love that. Thank you. Just got to organize it. So any more questions? 
It's been very interesting because the whole business about how you build community, I think, is crucial. And there's lots more that we could uh, talk about there, whether there are other activities apart from cooking and meals, which is a clear, obvious one uh, to try and bring people together. Um, so next time, and I have to figure this out, I won't be here. And so I'm, I'm trying to get Christina to co-host uh, to host this next time next time we're hearing from um a member of the the co-op housing federation of british columbia uh they have a wonderful uh website and i will send it out um and someone from that group will be talking to us about the difference that uh co-op housing makes because from the beginning i think we realized that co-op housing generally it is marked by affordability so it's much more open to people with restricted means and the, what can one build on the basis of a co-op uh, situation and what are the possibilities there? The feeling is uh, recently that our provincial government is actually uh, prepared to put more money into co-op housing again for obvious reasons. Um, but whether that comes to anything, we'll wait and see. But it's an interesting area, I think, um, to explore. Any comments on that? Because, um, yeah, because some of you obviously are experts in co-op housing. No, okay. Um, I'll, yeah, Penny. Yeah, I mean, the the yeah, as we'll find out, like next month that the co-op housing is is based on having a range of incomes in um in in the in the co-op um so the higher incomes subsidize the lower income so it's a very different model than than co-housing yeah I, yes. I also had one additional comment that i just wanted to make before we close uh can i do that yeah yeah uh it just triggered it. The thought was triggered with something you said about getting to know each other. Um, one thing we did not really do very well before we moved in was to come up with a set of shared values. <clears throat> and I would really, really strongly advise you all as a group to go through a process of defining what your shared values are before you go yeah. too much further into like living together because it's really, really helpful as just like a foundation and it helps other people that are joining you to understand who you are. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, Barbara. Uh, you're muted. You're I know muted. I was going to unmute it. Yes, I just want to follow along what Ruth just said. Um, I don't know. Um, my cousin Shirley Meridine was one of the founding members of a co-housing for old women in London. And they spent, that was their first yeah. series of, of meetings was exactly what Ruth just suggested, was really talking about their values and what it was and how they wanted to live together. And, and apparently that took a long, long time. And that was crucial before they went into all of the rest. And it changes too over time. It's not like it's set in stone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, this is thank you very much, Ruth. This has been wonderful. And uh yes. <laughs> and uh adds to our knowledge considerably. Okay. Um so thank you all for attending and uh we'll meet again next time in uh, the second Thursday in February, February the 9th. And uh, yes, send me ideas for speakers too. I'm always interested to hear more. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, nice yeah, to see thank you. you very much. Good yeah, luck bye. with your project. Yeah. <laughs>